What connection is there between the LDS temples and polygamy? Next on Polygamy, What Love Is This? To the faithful LDS, their temples are sacred, yes, right? Yes, that's very true. And central to their faith. I mean, they, your whole life just goes to the yeah. faithful LDS center around their, their temple activity. But members of today's LDS church are probably totally unaware that their temple endowment and their marriage rituals wouldn't exist today if Joseph Smith had not incorporated polygamy into their religion. Today's Mormon church has distanced itself from Mormon fundamentalists. They refuse to acknowledge that the original Mormon church holds full responsibility for today's polygamists. Mormon president Gordon Hinckley said this about Mormon fundamentalists. Very funny. President Gordon B. Hinckley in 1998 said, There is no such thing as a Mormon fundamentalist. It is a contradiction to use the two words together. Okay, so that's what their prophet said, right? Yeah. But their temples testify that there is such a thing as Mormon fundamentalists. We wonder if God was displeased with him for using the word Mormon when he oh, said that's, that. That's true. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> there is such a thing as a Mormon fundamentalist. They follow Joseph Smith and their polygamists. When Joseph was laying the foundation for today's Mormon religion, he included polygamy as an essential for Mormon exaltation. However, his only legal wife, Emma, refused to allow plural wives for her husband, so Joseph resorted to secrecy and, and later threats of destruction and for Emma if she didn't comply with what Smith said was God's command. While the secrecy and the denials of his polygamy was taking place, he came up with several creative ideas designed to draw women into polygamy and to entice the men to embrace it and to make them feel especially special for, because they were polygamous, yeah. for, for being polygamous. So he devised rituals that would help identify the secret polygamous and also defined certain terminology that identified the plurality of wives in his little church. Most of these secret rituals became permanent even after they gave up polygamy. And that's what we're talking about in this topic. Today's LDS church would be very different if it hadn't have been for Joseph Smith's polygamous teachings, his secrets, and deceitful covering up of his sexual affairs with so many dozens of women. We are going to present a few of today's temple rituals that originally originated directly from Joseph Smith's um, polygamy and would not even be part of the rituals today if it hadn't been for polygamy. Indeed, their temples, like I said, testify that there is such a thing as Mormon fundamentalists. So the first point uh, that we want to make is that the term celestial marriage is straight from original polygamy. I'd never thought of that. But that's true. And most most Mormons <laughs> today don't. don't. Yeah. Uh, they think celestial marriage refers to temple marriage, right. and that's what they're taught. Right. But it always referred exclusively to plural marriage until after Wilfred Woodruff's manifesto. If a man only had one wife and was married in a temple, it was not a celestial marriage. It was required that multiple uh, wives be included in marriages before a celestial marriage was recognized as a celestial marriage. We quote. Yeah, from William Clayton, he said, From Joseph Smith, I learned that the doctrine of plural and celestial marriage is the most holy and important doctrine ever revealed to man on the earth, and that without obedience to that principle, no man can ever attain to the fullness of exaltation in celestial glory. Now, there we have the plural marriage is essential. He right. says that. Absolutely. And it's in the same breath as celestial marriage. Mormon apostle Orson Pratt wrote several articles and they were all published in a book entitled The Seer. And in that book, he listed 27 rules of <laughs> celestial marriage. And you know, you can read it for yourself. Those rules of celestial marriage was how to live plural marriage. Those rules did not teach monogamy. They taught polygamy. We quote from Deseret News 1977 and from utlm.org. 
One of the most important tenets of the LDS Church is the necessity of temple ordinances. They teach that marriage in one of their temples is a requirement for eternal life. Past President Spencer W. Kimball said, Only through celestial or temple marriage can one find the straight way, the narrow path. Eternal life cannot be had in any other way. That's why they're being temples all over the world, right? That's right. This article uh, about talking about this on utlm.org points out that there is no mention of temple marriage in either the Bible or their Book of Mormon. I know it. It just isn't there. <laughs> There's no Old Testament temple ceremony that even remotely resembles LDS temple ceremonies. In fact, Jesus taught against swearing oaths, which they do in their rituals. But fundamentalists and LDS require ritualistic oaths and covenants in their temple ceremonies. We quote what Jesus said. Yes, in Matthew chapter 5, 33 through 37, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, that's what he said about taking oaths, okay, right. and just say yes or no, <laughs> don't take oaths. You can read uh, Exodus chapters 26 through 30 and find out that Mormonism's temple rituals have gone rogue from God's <laughs> original instructions. And again, the article on utlm.org observes that Jesus never mentions that a temple marriage is necessary for eternal life. In fact, he taught just the opposite. Yeah, in Luke 20. 34 through 36, he says, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but they shall, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal unto the angels and are the children of God. Now, Jesus is the Savior. I, I've said this several times through, during the years of doing the show. He's the Savior. Right. He knows how to save people. <laughs> yes. and, if, and if marriage was as essential as the LDS claim it is and as Mormon fundamentalists claim it, he would have said so. He would have said He's the right? Savior, yeah. Yes. Uh, and we taped a, a show a, a year or so ago uh, centered on the question, why doesn't Mormonism believe in what Jesus taught? And we're still asking that question, by the way. So Orson Pratt said this about the relationship between celestial marriage, polygamy, and eternal marriage. Yeah, from the Journal of Discourses. All these principles that I have treated upon pertaining to eternal marriage, the very moment that they are admitted to be true, it brings in plurality of marriage. And if plurality of marriage is not true, or in other words, if a man has no divine right to marry two wives or more in this world, then marriage for eternity is not true, and your faith is all vain. And all the sealing ordinances and powers pertaining to marriages for eternity are vain, worthless, good for nothing, for as sure as one is true, the other also must be true. Now, Amen. The, the, the LDS do not believe that today at all. They cannot believe that because without celestial marriage, polygamy, any, none of it's true. That's what he's saying. Yeah, that's right. So there it is. I mean, he's an apostle. He's a seer. Eternal marriage is valid only if it includes polygamy, according to original, foundational, fundamental, genuine LDS apostles. How many original prophets and apostles do today's leadership and membership throw under the bus <laughs> <I know. laughs> through disbelief in their yeah. fundamental origins and teachings or because a more progressive prophet comes along and claims to have more recent information, no matter that it contradicts previous prophetic announcements. Either a prophet is telling the truth all the time, or he just plain isn't a prophet of God, period. And, <laughs> and that would describe every single LDS or and or polygamy group prophet, one right after yeah. the other. Number one was the term celestial marriage always referred to polygamy before the manifesto. Number two is the idea of eternal marriage wasn't part of Mormonism until Joseph Smith began his secret plural wifery. Mm -hmm. According to correspondence to his wife Emma, he didn't believe in marriage after death. We quote. 
Yes, from Mormon Enigma, uh, Emma Hale Smith, page 76. Smith believed and taught that marriage ended at death. In fact, before Nauvoo, his love letters to his first wife, Emma, reflect his beliefs. In a letter to Emma on May 18, 1834, Smith signed, Your Husband Until Death. And writing from Carthage Jail on 4 November 1838, Smith told his wife, If I do not meet you again in this life, may God grant that we may somehow meet in heaven. Obviously, he didn't believe that they were going to be husband and wife there. No, he didn't. He, 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 and that's what the Bible teaches, that, that the marriage covenant ends at death, yeah. at our mortal death. He didn't contrive the eternal aspect of marriage until he was forced with the challenge of persuading other women to become his plural wives. Now, the carrot that he held out to some of them, that marrying him would seal up their eternal life, and that marriage to him would last forever. That idea was a brand new concept both to Joseph Smith and to Mormonism. Yeah. Before polygamy entered the scene, he believed marriage ended at death. So the idea of eternal marriage began only because of polygamy, another relationship that polygamy has on modern Mormonism and is testified by their Mormon temple rituals. Wow. Number three is a very important um, modern Mormon ritual called the Temple Endowment Ceremony. And this is also practiced by some polygamy groups. Do they do it in temples? Well, they have buildings, they, buildings, call, they their, call them. Yeah. They've been set apart for that or mm -hmm. something. Yeah. yeah, some of them. In order for Joseph Smith to keep his polygamy a secret, he in introduced the temple endowment and, and its oaths of secrecy. On May 4th of 1842, Joseph Smith initiated nine men into his new inner circle, and they were called the Holy Order. <laughs> they were also called the Quorum, the Holy Order of the Holy Priesthood, or the Quorum of the anointed. You have different terms, you yeah. know, and all referring to these these same groups of people. And you can read more detail about it on pages 139 and 140 in the Book of Mormon Enigma, uh, Ed, uh, Emma Hill Smith's biography. For the first year, only a very select few men received the endowment and all were sworn to secrecy based on a death oath. Now again, Jesus said, no swearing oaths. <laughs> By using a secret ceremony and oath, Smith was able to keep polygamy a secret for years, we quote. Hiram Smith, William Law, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, Willard Richards, Newell K. Whitney, George Miller, William Marks, and James Adams had met in Joseph's private office where he taught the ancient order of things for the first time in these last days and they received their washings, washings, anointings, and endowments. You see, all these men are involved with this endowment. Now, History of the Church, Volume 5, also documents the meetings and the participants. However, the temple endowment did not reflect or restore the ancient order of anything. It was another item that Joseph Smith <laughs> contrived. Tried to get this little inner circle of men. He had that and some other groups. Of and they had to be men he could trust yeah. that would keep all this a secret. Right, wouldn't go out. And, and, and so that's why he had all these rituals that the temple still does. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they do. The the endowment uh, required total secrecy on oath and certainly made them feel super special to be included in yeah. this private secret elite group of men, some of them having more wives than one. Had there been no polygamy, there would be no temple endowment ceremonies today in Mormon temples. Oh, it's quite a statement. It is. <laughs> but it's it probably is. True. That's where it started. Yeah. No temple marriages. There would not be any temple celestial marriages of today. Hmm. And no garments that today's modern LDS members are required to wear, which brings us to number four, how polygamy relates to the to the garments. secret sacred temple garments that hmm. they wear today. And most members I would I would guess have no idea. No. That all these things are connected to polygamy, I, I, directly I have no idea. to polygamy. No. These garments are worn by every faithful LDS member, and they wear them to this day, and they had its origin in and was because of polygamy. It had its beginning with Joseph Smith's secret circle of men that we mentioned earlier. The secret garments set the polygamous men apart from monogamous men. It was their uniform required for men to be involved with spiritual wifery. <laughs> we quote from Mormon Enigma. 
The participants of the endowments wore white clothing that was not part of their daily apparel. Joseph designed an undergarment for the endowment ceremonies that would be worn beneath regular clothing. Elizabeth Allred made the pattern. Okay, I think they got three patterns done and gone before they finally came up with the one that they wanted, really? but they were working on it. Now, <laughs> non-polygamists were not doing endowments. Therefore, non-polygamists did not wear these endowment undergarments. So not all members went through and did endowments? Not at first, huh? Unless they were... Nope getting married or pl plural marriage. Plural marriage, wow. right. And endowments were essential, uh, were essential for exaltation, according to Joseph Smith's mm -hmm. new polygamy doctrine. We quote, After being involved in the construction and design of the garments, the building of the temple, and hearing about their place in the endowment in the Relief Society, why had women had not been admitted to the endowment council? Joseph taught that a man must obey God to be worthy of the endowment and that a wife must obey a righteous husband to marry merit the same reward. Until Emma could be obedient to Joseph and give him plural wives, she could not participate in the endowment ceremonies, yet he taught her that the endowment was essential for exaltation. Damned wow. if you do, damned if you don't. <laughs> <I guess. clears throat> in Mormonism... Exaltation is not the same as salvation. That's right. But biblically, there is only salvation, which is equivalent and is, a, is eternal life, which is life forever and ever in heaven with Jesus Christ. So number five um, of how the temple, today's temple is connected back with early Mormon polygamy is that they have the private temple marriages and a family cannot attend without a temple recommend. That's, yeah, and that's, that's true, true today yeah, still. So today's privacy of Mormon temple marriages began only and because of polygamy. Before Nauvoo polygamy, Mormon marriages were conducted anywhere they wanted. Surprise. Yeah. And sit down for this one. Non-Mormons could attend marriages that were performed in the Kirtland temple. That was before the Nauvoo oh, temple. Wow. Joseph Smith's diary lists marriages he performed in the temple. Those lists contain members of non, the names of non-members who participated or who were witnesses to the marriages. Wow. So, and you could read the list for yourself in the personal writings of Joseph Smith, 1835 through 1836. The LDS today continue with the tradition of closed temple marriages, which is a direct legacy of Joseph Smith's efforts to be sure polygamy was kept a secret. Very interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. He had to do this, of course, for self-protection because he was marrying other men's wives <laughs> without their husbands knowing it. And so closed and secret ceremonies were the answer, followed by oaths to maintain their secrecy. So it all ties together, it doesn't sure it? sure does. So many changes I, for an unchangeable <laughs> God. <laughs> Number six, so the true. practice of sealings. Now before, and they do that today, but it all started with polygamy. Before polygamy came into Mormonism, their marriages were just ordinary marriages, like we said. But to take another wife, especially if she was already married, they needed a new word so it didn't sound like adultery. Even though it was, it had to sound different. <laughs> so Joseph Smith decided on the word sealing, we quote. Yeah, also from Mormon Enigma. Simultaneously with the endowment and plural marriage, Joseph formalized a third concept. He explained to Emma that husbands and wives could be married, sealed forever by proper priesthood authority. Couples who had been married in traditional ceremonies were considered to be married for time or until death separated them. But unions made in the new Mormon ceremonies were to last beyond the grave. These marriages were termed eternal marriages or sealings and could be performed for living couples as well as for a living spouse and a deceased one. Thus a man could be sealed to his dead wife and also to his living wife. Understanding this new doctrine led to the next step, which was the marriage of a living husband to several living wives. This gradual explanation of doctrine seemed to alleviate some of the repugnance when plural marriage was introduced. Although Joseph did not teach plural marriage in the meetings of the endowment council, acceptance of the sealing ordinance enabled those whom he taught privately to accept 
polygamy. Okay, so so much underhanded secrecy and deceit. So oh women who already had husbands could say they were married to their first husband, but sealed to Joseph Smith. Uh -huh. uh, although they had sex with both Joseph Smith and their legal husbands, they considered the marriage contract to be different, and so they wouldn't be guilty of adultery. Well, there's some rationalization oh, there. Oh, boy. <laughs> they act as if the strength of God's commands depended on the terminology <laughs> yeah. used to describe their sins. And number seven, even the design of the modern temples reflect their polygamous teachings, and probably most members would never believe that either, know that. No, this is fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> Someone once asked the question, why was the Nauvoo Temple so different than the Kirtland Temple? Both came from the same unchanging God, right? <laughs> we ask, why is it so different than the Biblical Temple? Isn't it supposed to be a restoration? Yes, that's true. The Kirtland Temple was not an endowment house like the Nauvoo Temple was. Modern Mormon temples have closed doors, secret ceremonies, and odd clothing, all of which was inspired by polygamy and started in the Nauvoo Temple. In fact, the celestial room, which every temple has, yes. the concept was created to reinforce the idea that polygamous men would be with all of their wives in heaven as one big family. The contemporary practice in the temple when Mormon families re reunite after the veil actually began as an illustration that Joseph Smith used to show how polygamy worked in heaven. My goodness. We quote. <laughs> Spending time in the celestial room with husbands, wives, family members, and other loved ones reminds us that as long as we keep our faith in Christ and are true to our temple covenants, we will all be together as a family in Heavenly Father's celestial kingdom. Now that's a contemporary statement yes. from the LDS Church. So they're, they're covering up, um, and maybe they don't even realize that it I connects know. directly back to polygamy. I just think what a surprise it's going to be for Mormons or polygamists when they wake up on the other side and find out that there's no celestial glory, that there's no polygamy, no forever families that they hold to be truth. should be quite shocking. I know, I know. That's why we do this show. We want them to check out and discover the truth. Celestial marriage is found in LDS scripture contains or remains an integral part of the faith and they have never renounced it or denied section 132 no, the that it includes polygamy. Yeah. They claim it also refers to monogamy, but polygamy was and is what section 132 is all about. The only reason that section 132 was ever written was to convince Emma that polygamy was a revelation from God and to subject her to its absolute requirement. But she still didn't believe it after she read it and tossed it into the fireplace where it belonged. <laughs> we quote, also from utlm.org. As long as the Mormon leaders continue to publish Doctrine and Covenants section 132, they cannot repudiate the revelation or that Joseph Smith called it a command from God. They would necessarily destroy their doctrine concerning temple marriage if they renounced polygamy. Both were revealed in the revelation of polygamy section 132. And so if they, because they've changed celestial marriage to mean monogamy. Yeah when it originally meant polygamy, they can't take section 132 out. No. Because then it completely removes the whole thing. They're stuck with it. So they're, yeah, they're <laughs> stuck with it. But it still is about polygamy, and you could read and the context tells you that yeah. it's about polygamy. And the warning to Emma and all that. Right, yeah. and the ten virgins and, yeah. and all of that. So polygamy and temple marriage for Mormons stands or falls together. Uh, we quote Charles Penrose at a conference in Centerville, Utah. Yeah, from the Millennial Star. Elder Charles W. Penrose showed that the Revelation was the only one published on celestial marriage, and if the doctrine of plural marriage was repudiated, so must the glorious principle of marriage for eternity, the two being indissolubly interwoven with each other. Well, there you have it. <laughs> and, I, and I wonder what today's LDS members would think if they realized that this is actually the truth of their religion. Yeah, it just isn't talked about or, I mean, it, it, we're just unaware of it. I'm uh, totally unaware of, of it. The connection. Yeah. yeah. 
Polygamy may not be practiced today in the LDS Church, but its influence on their doctrine and practices still haunts the lives of millions of active members every time they go to the temple. The temple endowment, the garments, mm -hmm. the oath of secrecy, even the original Relief Society, the temple celestial room, the term celestial marriage, all have their origins in Joseph Smith implementing polygamy into Mormonism. When polygamy was banned, they kept the ceremonies. Hmm. Yet it was, the ceremonies were involved because of polygamy. Yeah. And they all serve to affirm, of course, that polygamists are Mormon fundamentalists remaining faithful to Joseph Smith's teachings and that the LDS Church has become apostate. We quote John Stewart. I, and I would imagine the polygamy groups uh, accuse the mainstream church of, of being uh, apostate. apostate. Yeah, I, 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 was, I was taught that growing up, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From Brigham Young and his wives, the church has never and certainly will never renounce this doctrine. The revelation on plural marriage is still an integral part of LDS scripture and always will be. Okay. <laughs> now, he didn't say that the church would never cease to practice polygamy temporarily. Right. He said they will never we'll renounce, renounce it. it. Yeah. And they can't, again, because we just found, just <laughs> discovered that it's polygamy and celestial marriage is all tied yeah, up together. It sure is. Now, the biblical temple, which was used only for sacrificial worship of God, and there is no resemblance, by the way, of that to the LDS temples and their secret oaths and tokens and rituals and ceremonies, had nothing to do with the kind of temple worship that the Mormons do today. However, both the mainline church and the fundamentalists, neither of them are doing God's will as described in the Bible. The New Testament tells us that God does does not dwell in temples built by human hands. He dwells in the hearts and lives of his people. Yeah. And it is our faith in Jesus Christ that is precious to God, not ordinances and rituals and certainly not marriages. And that's the good news. Isn't that's it? the good news. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. You don't have to keep qualifying to get into the temple. Don't for, have to be yeah. worthy and answer all those questions <laughs> and all that because our we are the temple of God if we are genuine followers of Jesus. Yeah, that's good news. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, very fascinating things, things that I'd never heard before. Uh, <laughs> and, and realizing the connection between the two yeah. and the secrecy. I mean, obviously, I always knew about the secrecy, but uh, not that it was tied into so closely Joseph to Smith polygamy. and these inner circle the, folks. The, and, so when somebody says there's no such thing as Mormon fundamentalists, say, go look at your temple. It's <laughs> all based on fundamental Mormonism. That's all it is, yeah. You know, we cannot conclude a topic like this without applying truth to all of it. The New Testament teaches that there's only one eternal union and sealing that authentic Christianity experiences, and that is an eternal and spiritual uniting with Jesus Christ. The New Testament symbolizes it as the marriage of the bride and the lamb, one bride and one lamb. It isn't an actual marriage as we know in our mortality, but it's a promise and a covenant by God to his true followers of his love, provision, and protection forever and ever. Of God granting us a new life with him in heaven, full of joy, delights, and peace forevermore. A life that is centered on Jesus Christ, the one who purchased our entrance into his eternal glory. We pray for those who sidetracked with unnecessary commands and ordinances and requirements that they think earns what in reality is absolutely free. It's a gift, but a gift must be received to make it yours. Thank you for watching.